All right, welcome back. So, the neuroscience of magic. Um, we've talked about illusions, now we're going to, visual illusions mainly, now we're going to talk about uh, cognitive illusions and that I will um, discuss a little bit about uh, what uh, cognitive illusion versus a sensory or visual illusion is. But I want to start with uh, showing you just a pretty short clip of a, a, one of our main magician collaborators. Um, this is uh, Apollo Robbins, the gentleman thief, and uh, uh, watch him manipulate this coin. And it's gone. So, you may be wondering, this is a, this is a, a, a very short fragment of what you might watch in a magic show, but uh, it goes back to the issue that we were discussing before the break, how a uh, large move covers a small move. Um, I don't think I'm going to disclose a big magic secret if I let you all know that in fact the coin didn't actually disappear, but never left the original hand. But the motion of the hand that uh, moves away and that uh, then appears to uh, make the coin go away, this attracts our attention, and if this movement was embedded in a magic routine, you would never be able to perceive that the coin actually never left the first hand. In fact, even knowing what you know now, this, uh, this technique is called the, the French drop, it's a classic magical technique. Now that you know how the French drop is done, I can guarantee you, you will go to your next magic show and magicians will do it or do something very similar to it and still you will not be able to recognize it because the magician will have uh, misdirected your attention in such a way that uh, you won't be able to, to do it. But, uh, but what I want to uh, actually direct your attention now to is how the hand that is actually more critical to the action the hand that is actually containing the coin is the hand that appears to really be doing nothing and that uh, the, the magician is keeping it completely relaxed and that, that that's where the critical motion is, happen, is happening. The other hand, the, the hand that is just actually window dressing, this hand, is, it's all an illusion that something interesting is happening over here. So, so again, we're going back to, to the example of what uh, Jimmy was uh, bringing up uh, earlier today about how two hands may be doing two different things and the hand that you're paying attention to is the opposite hand. That's that you're, you're directing your, your attention to, to the wrong hand um, in, uh, in magic and, uh, in, and in the, some abuse situations as well. Um, so, so a few years ago, we are uh, now, um, about 10 years ago, a bit over 10 years ago, we, we started this, this collaboration. We, we initially um, were introduced to, to James Randi, the, the amazing Randi, and he introduced us in, himself to, to other magicians and magic theorists, more, most critically Teller from uh, the duo Penn and Teller, Mac King, uh, Apollo Robbins, whom we just saw, and Johnny Thompson, and we started a conversation about uh, how two fields as different as uh, neuroscience and magic, what they had in common, what they could each other bring to the table. And, and it appeared, in, in fact, that we did have a lot of areas of overlap. It actually, that collaboration reminds me of uh, now having uh, they started this, the, the, the present in collaboration with, uh, with Jimmy and, and, and his community about uh, how these two different areas of, of uh, active research that in principle you might not be able to think how they relate to each other, there may be, there may be a lot to, to this uh, area of overlap. But, uh, but we basically, when we were starting to, to, talk, to talk to magicians, we realized that both magicians and neuroscientists we, we are students of, uh, of human behavior, of, of human perception and cognition. Now we have different goals. Magicians uh, do it for, for the sake of their art. We want to advance knowledge about the brain. But, uh, but fundamentally, 
we have a, uh, an important shared interest in illusion. Well, this is uh, just the cover of an academic uh, paper that we published together with these magicians. We also wrote a few follow-up articles for the public for Scientific American. And, that, uh, and this jump started our, our collaboration. And as we were having these conversations with magicians, what we were very surprised about, and that this was a revelation to us, was that magicians, they're using illusions on top of illusions. So that's something very different from what we're doing in the laboratory, because in the lab, when we're trying to study an illusion, like any of the illusions that we showed you previous to the break, we try to study that and nothing else, so we isolate a particular effect from anything else that could provide an alternative explanation. We want to be very sure about what the mechanism is. So, so we isolate. Magicians don't care about this. Magicians, they want to foolproof their tricks. And so they pile illusions on top of illusions. They want to play with your perception, with your attention, with your memory, with uh, the choices that you make or you think you're making. Uh, in a sense, that may be, very well be what's uh, happening as well with, with abusers, too. That uh, it's not just a matter of uh, misdirecting attention, but it's also constructing a narrative and playing with emotions and uh, uh, influencing what memories are later recalled or fail to be recalled. So, so this is just a listing of the kinds of illusions that you might see in, a, in the same magic trick. So magicians use special effects, that's the uh, same as in Hollywood. So these are like fake uh, gunshots and explosions on, on stage. Secret devices and mechanical artifacts, what magicians call gimmicks. They also use optical illusions. This is smoke and mirrors. And I'm going to make a difference here between optical and visual illusions. These illusions we, we showed you earlier, like if you remember these faces being distorted, that's a visual illusion that is constructed purely in your brain. Another illusion has to do with the physical properties of light, say a reflection in a mirror or a pencil that you put in a glass of water and appears to bend due to the different refraction indices of air and water. Those are optical illusions. And magicians use both types optical as well as visual illusions also, uh, illusions in the other senses, there are auditory illusions and illusions that involve multiple senses and their interactions as well. And magicians also use what we call cognitive illusions. And the difference between sensory illusions and cognitive illusions is basically at what level in the hierarchy of brain processing these take place. So the uh, sensory illusions are more sort of like the perceptual level like the, most of the illusions that we show you previous to the break are of a visual or perceptual nature. But the cognitive illusions affect what we call cognitive processes, such as choice or decision making, or causal inference, linking cause and effect, or attention and misdirection, as well as memory. These are all cognitive processes that magicians manipulate. During their, during their shows. And uh, so we're, we're going to focus on this presentation on, uh, co on cognitive illusions, particularly on misdirection of attention. But then during the follow-up discussion and Q&A, we can touch upon any of the other cognitive effects as well. Okay, so let's... Let's give an example of how a magician might, might use these effects. This is actually a magic trick um, in which a magician learned, learned this demonstration from scientists, actually. So this was a scientific illusion before it was a magic illusion. And, and he actually, could you, hold it to the, when it, when it, could you hold it to the speaker when it comes up? Um, so, and he actually developed this into a magic show effect. So let's go ahead and look at this. This is Darren Brown uh, doing a, a change blindness uh, demonstration. Okay, go ahead. Most of us think we're pretty observant, but with a bit of mind control, I wanted to see if I could make these people take even the most obvious things for granted. Excuse me. Do you know how to get to Trinity Church from here? Yeah. You see that church down there? Yep, straight through there. 
and then keep going down the river bottom. Sorry, which way? You see that church is down there? Yeah. You stay on that, which is, I believe, Broadway. And then you walk down two or three blocks, and Trinity Church is on the right hand side. We're walking in that direction. Okay. Okay. So, did any anybody here not notice anything strange just happened? Raise your hand if you didn't. It's okay if you didn't. So, so for those of you who didn't notice it, the the man with the map changed in the middle. Okay, changed in the middle. So let's go ahead and look at that again. Excuse me, you don't know where Trinity Church is, do you? Might be Wall Street and Broadway. Okay. Well, we're, we're down here somewhere, aren't we? Yeah, you see the guy Trinity Church. Church. Oops, sorry. 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 Uh, yeah. Inside the Trinity Church, right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you keep going that way, then you left Broadway, then you go down a couple of blocks. Yeah. And, uh, Thanks very much. That seemed almost too easy, so later on, I see how far I can take it. Excuse me, do you know where uh, Trinity Church is? In that direction. Okay. Yeah. Last time, I switched with someone who looked a little bit like me, but where's the fun in that? Excuse me, you know who, who could best direct you? you? The other side. You see where that lady's standing? Sure. And that's the pool. No, the lady in the gray. The other side? Yeah, the other side of but the you, pool. So you don't know where it is? Uh, exactly what street? No, but it's in that direction. Okay. Yeah, Thank you. okay? Thank you. Excuse me. Do you know where um, Trinity Church is? From here. Uh, yeah, fine. Come on, come on. I'll take you. Or you want to walk now? Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to catch some other people. Sorry, sorry, sorry guys. Sorry. <laughs> okay, listen, saying. once you go on Broadway, yes. remember the numbers are going. I could have sworn it was another guy. <laughs> um, on. Once you hit the Broadway, you're going down. Yes. Walk up straight so that, that way. way and just walk straight down. You're going to see it. It's, right, it's really brown. That's brilliant. Thanks for your help. All right, but don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. So I was talking over him. But if, if, if I hadn't talked over him, you would have heard him say, oh, I thought you turned into someone else. How could those words come out of your mouth? But that just happened, right? And not only that, but he didn't think much of it. He was just like, meh, okay, it's right over there. You just walk this way, I'll, I'll show you. I'll just go with you. I trust you completely, I'll walk down the street with you, right? So this, happened, this kind of thing happens to us all the time, right? That we think we see things that we realize must not have just happened to us, even though they just did, right? They dismissed this, okay? You see where this is going in the context of, of sex and abuse. Okay, so let's go ahead and go for it. Excuse me, you know where Trinity Church is? Ah, great. What are we on here? Are we sort of there? Right here. Right through, thank you. Go on. We are Brooklyn Bridge. You want to cross over there? Go down Broadway and you'll be right there. Okay, thank you. <laughs> that's, un that's, that's amazing, right? That's amazing. That that All right, so, so here we have a situation of change blindness. So that's where you have something happen during a distraction. And so you're kind of comparing before and after a distraction occurs, okay? Or an event, something changes occurs. So in a sense, it's a memory illusion because you're comparing before and after something, okay? Now, what we're going to show you now is a, a test. Now that you know that can happen, we're going to show you a test of this happening. I'm just going to tell you. It's a, it's a change blindness demonstration. I'm not going to deceive you at all. This is going to happen to you right now. All you have to do, and this should be easy, right? You know it's happening. It's a, all you have to do is count the number of changes that you see. Okay? <coughs> no problem. So go ahead. Go ahead and play it. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, 
was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. <laughs> But, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. Sorry, madam. It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? Okay, how observant were you? How many changes did you see? Anybody? Four. You saw four? That's not bad. Five. When I said it wasn't bad, I, I lied. It's, it's terrible. There were 21 changes. And they all happened to you, and you knew they were coming. Okay? So, don't believe it. Let's play it again. This time from a different perspective. Okay? So that you can see them all. Uh, uh, action. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest... Lady Smythe. That was, that happened to you right now. Okay, so, now this can also happen in the context of happening to you right now, not just during a distraction, okay? So most of the people here will, for example, notice this, this uh, child and her mother and not realize, because it's such an engaging photograph, that the child has six fingers on her right hand, right? Even though hands are very salient, stimulate, we care about those things a lot, it's been in your retina for several seconds while I mentioned this to you, and I, I invited you to look at the picture. You looked at their faces and, and were drawn away from, from things that you considered less of a priority than the, than the hand itself. Um, and that we call inattentional blindness, okay? So, whereas change blindness is a memory illusion because it happens at different times, inattentional blindness proves that this can happen online right now based on how you pay attention to something and miss something else, okay? And that's a lot of what magicians are doing. They're using both change blindness and inattentional blindness illusions to carry out what they do. Um, this is just an example of how we can study attention. This was the first illusion uh, in the, in, from visual science where we could actually measure the magnitude of the effect of attention to enhance and suppress. So if you look at this green dot in the center here, what, you'll, what you can notice is if you pay attention to the upper left circle, it becomes brighter than the other ones. Now stop and pay attention to the upper right circle without moving your eyes. And it gets brighter. And then pay attention to the bottom one, and it gets brighter while the upper ones get dimmer. And in and, and the laboratory, we can now measure the magnitude change as this happening. And this tells us, allows us to measure how much does attention actually enhance versus suppress what we're paying attention to versus what we're not paying attention to. Before we had this, the only way we could measure attention was by doing it in a performance measure, where we had, for example, something happening on the right and something happening on the left while you fixated and you had to measure how many things you could count or how many things you missed on the left and the right. This is a direct measure of how strong attention is while you pay attention, okay? So, uh, so this is just a clue to how we do this kind of thing uh, scientifically. And so um, this brings, brings uh, forth the, the, the question of how does this actually happen in the brain and how do, does a bunch of sacks of salt water with some proteins in their membranes uh, produce this? All right, so Susanna and I have done experiments in the brain to actually look at this, and we have some ideas about how attention actually happens. So if you'll click that, it goes something like this. So imagine Apollo Robbins has light reflecting off of him during that magic trick that Susanna showed you, and that light goes into your retina, 
and it gets transduced into electrochemical signals in the retina that travel through the optic nerves all the way back to the primary visual cortex in the back of the brain, where the information is arrayed in a, in a pattern called a retinotopic pattern, because it matches the way light is actually on the retina. And this gives us a clue to the circuits by which attention could work, because you can see the circuits in the brain back here in the visual cortex actually are paying attention or looking at this hand centrally, and there's no coin in it. But what's very often the periphery where we're not looking with the center of our eyes is this other hand where the coin actually is, of course. Okay? So what magicians are doing is they're getting us to pay attention to this part of the visual field and suppress the other parts of the visual field, just like that with that Venn diagram. But now they're getting it to do it for they're tricking us. They're using a mental jiu-jitsu, right? To get us to use our own attentional system to enhance what they want us to enhance and suppress what they don't want us to see, okay? That is a key aspect of misdirection in magic and we think in, um, in pedophilia as well. And so when we studied how this works in the context of magic and in the context of the primary visual cortex, and how we see attention, uh, it was it works something like this. So go ahead and click this so that, that these circuits in the brain, these neurons receive information from the incoming information about the motion of the hand, for example. And this would be where we're paying attention. And then these same cells nearby suppress the surrounding cells so that these the neurons that see the other hand are actually suppressed. Just like the, the Venn diagram, it got brighter in one place and suppressed in the other, depending on where we placed our attention, right? And I couldn't control where you were attending. I was telling you where to attending, but I couldn't really, you could have attended somewhere else if you wanted to, and the same effects would have happened. So magicians are tricking you into suppressing information they don't want you to see. And just to give you an idea that that's actually happening, this is Apollo Robbins, now uh, in, in the context of his um, natural environment, which is pickpocketing people on the streets of Las Vegas, okay? And here, let's take a look at him do his job. That's a nice ring, man. It's a tight fit for you, isn't it? Yes, it is. Hmm, it doesn't really work for me either. Do you have another one? <laughs> Sorry about that. It looks like the one I'm wearing, doesn't oh! it? <laughs> yeah, oh. you gotta hold on to that, man. Don't lose it. Oh, yeah. Well, this might be down just a little bit lower. Hold on. No, no, no. Well, the only thing that's discovery about this is that we end up with this. Does this belong to you, man? Check it out. And you had something down here, too, didn't you? Here, let me see. We can see if we can make this go just a little bit further. It should have a little familiar ring to it. Looks just like the coin we were playing with a while ago, man. Bunch of clothes. I didn't turn my ring in a cents. Well, I didn't turn your ring, I just put it in another place. Down by your pocket there was a ring, man. Does that belong to you? Oh. <laughs> you can give that back to him. Is that your ring, man? No. You better put that on before uh, we go. Better. Yeah, be that's trouble. cool. Now, this coin, did you see the date on the coin? It's 1964. 64 is special. There's a reason why that's special. I'll tell you why exactly. You have a wallet on you, right? I do. Yeah? Did you have cash as well? I couldn't tell you. Yeah, I was checking for some cash right down here by your pocket. Down here, you had not a whole lot of stuff. This is interesting. It turned it up. While we were looking at that coin, that with a Sprint cell phone. That's the kind that you have, isn't it? I would use that to call if you're missing any cash and stuff like that. To be honest with you guys, after you have something like that happen, natural reaction, you're going to want to have a cigarette. Is that the kind that you smoke, man? That is the kind you smoke? Bring out your pack. Where's your cigarettes, man? You got some? No? Right there? Right here. Oh, this would be the rest of them. They're all right here, man. Yeah, that's right. You keep the cigarettes. You want to light one of those up. Sorry about that. Oh, you broke one. You broke one. Well, that's a lucky one. That's lucky. That's tradition. Thank you, man. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, man. Good job. Thank you, sir. So, Paula Robbins is a Jedi master, and these aren't the droids you're looking for, right? So, so what just happened there? Right? All the different things that just happened. Apollo... He, he was touching his, his subjects, getting them to think about what he's touching over here while he was actually also touching them other places and grabbing their stuff. This sound like it relates to, to, to sex abuse and pedophilia, right? So he was giving a narrative to draw someone down the garden path, right? So for example, the coin. What was the, the year on the coin? 1964. 
And that was important, and he was going to tell us why. Why was it important again? What's that? He was asking for his wallet then. Right. So what, why was it important? It was a big fat lie. That's why it was important. It wasn't important at all. He wasn't going to bring it up. He, that was, he was stealing the cigarettes right then. Okay? So, so the guy was holding out the coin. He was looking at 1964, right? He was staring at the coin as hard as he could to read the little tiny numbers, 1964. He's thinking to himself, like most of us, something like, what happened in 1964? Was that the year Kennedy died? What was what was that again? I don't remember what was going on. You're having a dialogue with yourself in your mind. That's what you're paying attention to. In the meantime, Apollo Robbins could have smoked all those guys' cigarettes and he wouldn't even know it. Right? He took out the guy's pack of cigarettes from his pocket, removed the cigarettes, put those in his pocket, Apollo's pocket, put the cigarette pack in the same place during that period of time, with the 1964 coin, and not only didn't he see it, you didn't see it. He's inebriated, right? Wow, that just happened, right? All of those things that Apollo handed back to those people, he stole from them on camera right here in front of them and in front of you, and you knew this was gonna happen, right? That's amazing, right? <coughs> So the idea, it's not far-fetched that this kind of thing could be happening to hide from parents what's happening to children. It could be happening to children themselves and they're being told that something else is happening, okay? There is no limit to how much an abuser could affect the mind of the person that is actually being abused or the protectors of those people or even a chaperone that's right there who's not the protector of that person. Just to child care, right? So, uh, eyewitness testimony in this case, you know, it's, it's up in the air. Okay. So I'm gonna let Susanna wrap wrap up this, and we'll then we'll have a discussion. I don't have much to to add. I think that uh, we can just uh, open it up for open it up for questions, and that uh, I'd be. Uh, be curious about uh, whether Jimmy would like to have any other further thoughts to, to share in this uh, context and, uh, and of course answer any questions that, uh, that we can answer that you may have. Yes. Uh, this isn't so much a question, but it's more of a statement. Um, I know we've lost some of our law enforcement because shift changes and things are coming up. But what's really impacted on me here is even beyond the discussion of Peter Julia, I keep thinking back to the officer safety on the street, yeah. uh, on calls, and just some of the things that, as attentive as we think we are, right. some of the things that happen to be life threatening to us, and, and, and how to kind of think how to pay better attention to it, uh, yes. be focusing. And, it, and this is a very important. We haven't much thought about the interaction between emotions and attention, but uh, emotions prioritize attention. We have talked to law enforcement previously, and that uh, attention is a real problem, uh, I mean, in general, but this happens in a, a life and death scenarios where attention shrinks, actually people who experience it, they talk about uh, tunnel vision, they talk about losing their auditory capabilities because their attention is so focused, maybe focused on the wrong thing, and that, that it, because their, their emotions are so high that they cannot voluntarily prioritize their attention in the way that will be most efficient. So that's, uh, that's very difficult. And magicians, for instance, they take advantage of this. Uh, some of the emotions that they use during their shows, they can use horror, but they can also use humor. It really, uh, any emotion can, can prioritize attention. Magicians tell us that uh, when the audience laughs, time stops and they can do anything and get away with it. Realizing how much, even though we may not be intending to do it, how much we could be misleading or, or guiding them, 
It's a very difficult problem. And, and uh, self-awareness is the first step to, to law enforcement making sure that they do their job the most efficiently as possible. And to be the most efficacious. Absolutely. It's a very good point. In the Nasser case, you talked about it, he was doing he was doing those manipulations and everything right in front of the parents. And he did he premise it with saying this is the the, the latest scientific evidence that this is what we need to do? I mean, how did yeah, he he was actually describing pelvic floor techniques to the parents as as he was sexually assaulting with his other hand. So so. Uh, you guys would know the science behind that a lot more, but he, you know, he's using technique with not only the bigger motion with this hand that he's doing, he's doing the massages, the external massages, um, but he's also doing a, a, the mind jitsu stuff, where, you know, where he's, he's actually drawing attention to the very place that, um, you know, we think of misdirection as pulling, pulling your attention off somewhere else. That's not really what misdirection is. Misdirection is, is actually redirection, where you're directing the attention to exactly the place where you wouldn't expect it. And that, uh, right now in our laboratories, we're, we're actually doing research where we're getting at uh, how having a coherent story can literally uh, make you less aware that a card, say, is, is marked has a very visible mark and you will not see it because you have a story that makes sense. And that, uh, so, so that's part of it, having a coherent story that is drawing attention. But uh, even an incoherent story, maybe just the fact that somebody is talking to you is drawing, your attentional resources are very limited. So, and that's sort of what Apollo does. He's using his pattern, he's constantly chattering. Uh, besides touching and that, uh, showing things to people. So he's engaging all their senses, and the more that you engage towards one target, you're taken away from what other people could be possibly paying, paying attention to. So, so that's, uh, that's another element as well. And, and finally, just to, to follow up on what Jimmy said, that uh, we, we often say that the brain is the magician's best accomplice because the, the magician or, or the abuser in this case, they don't need to um, get you to ignore certain types of information, certain types of input. All that they need you to do is uh, make you pay attention to something and pay strong attention to that something, to that uh, particular part of, uh, of the scene, to that particular moment in time and your own brain will suppress everything else. Yeah, I mean, even in that, that uh, excerpt of, of the letter that I read, you know, the intentionality of, of my own dad putting, putting his hands on the child's buttocks because he said that he put in parentheses, you, you couldn't see it because it was, it was in the letter, so I just read it, but he put in parentheses, and the parent sees this as, um, um, I'm holding the child secure. So it's, it's groping, it's intentional groping, but it's drawn attention. He's intentionally drawn attention to, to that area as he passes by, by the parent because they associate the hand underneath as, as drawing somebody in and making them feel secure. And as he passes by, he, you know, he shifts his body and then you get the, the, you know, the visual illusion that, that goes with that where then you have the fingers that slide up in, you know, into the genitals area, and it's it's all, like the intentionality behind this, uh, when, I, when I read that, and when I read your book and under, understood, like, this isn't just basic principles, like, these are really thought out, well executed, well rehearsed techniques that are step by step by step, and they're, and they're multi-layered um, effects that, that they're trying to produce through narrative, through, um, through misdirection, through um, visual, uh, perceptions, manipulating the body in a certain way, um, where, you know, the, the ball doesn't go uphill, it's just the way that you man manipulated that object um, makes you think that the balls are going uphill. You know, they're using so many different techniques, and, and you know, if you guys go back and parse um, some, of this, some of these testimonies uh, with the Larry Nasser case, um, 
your mind is going to be blown after what you just learned today. And you're going to learn, I mean, Larry Nasser was using highly sophisticated techniques. I just want you to expand a little bit, though, on how, just like a magician to start off from no predation to highly sophisticated. Right, right, right. So, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's well-researched and well-known that, you know, abusers have, have a, a decent chance, of course, that's debated, of, of rehabilitation um, up until their later teenage years. After that, um, of course, that it's very debatable, but, but nobody talks about pedophiles being cured. Nobody in the professional field that I'm aware of not one person am I aware of who talks about pedophiles being cured past the age of 17, 18 years old. Um, now, they talk about it more cognitively and, you know, the brain gets hardwired in, in certain ways. I don't know that that's necessarily the case. I, I think it's more an issue of... Um, you, you had made a comment, Steve, that uh, Apollo Robbins, you're going to see him in his element. Uh, when he's in the streets, his whole persona changes, and he's and he just he's so natural, and he's in his element. And Apollo Robbins can't stop being a pickpocket uh, because once you learn how to manipulate people and do that successfully, uh, same with Darren Brown. Well, I could replace them, keep replacing them with people who look like me, but what did he say? What's the fun in that? You see where that's going? So, you know, the, the more they get away with it, and Dad wrote about that in that letter, not just that letter, but he's written about it quite extensively, there's a level of boredom that, that happens um, not just with up in the ante and abusing in front of people, but, but then doing that successfully and then doing more brazen things and more, more bold things. He told me by the time of his arrest, he's like, I was doing things so blatantly in front of people. He said, I literally couldn't believe that, that people weren't seeing how badly I was abusing these kids right in front of their face. I mean, he's written about it very extensively uh, in letters from prison. And you talked about what he said, he was Yeah, yeah, but you know, I again, it's it, it's theory at this at this point because it's it's not really researched, but but I theorize that that, that addiction is is certainly not the sexual addiction. I, I think that has very little to do with it. Um, I think the addiction is 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 the challenge. You know, the addiction of challenge, um, increasing the challenge. Um, Apollo Robbins, I just watched, I, I love the guy, and I just watched something the other day, or maybe maybe I read it, I don't know where I saw it now. My memory is really bad. <laughs> it's been rewritten. Um, but he was talking about, oh, I know what it was, it was a, uh, an interview that, that he had done in, in a paper several years ago, but in the interview he said, I envision a show where I hand out parts to people, um, and I forget how it was, but in the end, people people are going to reach into their pockets, and he was going to have planted in his entire audience these these hearts that open up and like fly away or something. And so the person interviewing him said, um, "Do you know how how to do that yet?" And he said, "No, but I'm working on it." You know, so it's he's already thinking years in advance of of this trick, and he has the theory written in his mind. He just knows that he's going to find a way to make that happen. And, and he probably will, you know? And it's just that, it's the excitement of how far can I take this? And, and are people really this blind to what I'm doing? 
you know, the, the magic for us is, is breathtaking to the magician. Um, it's routine and it's boring and they're thinking in their mind, you know, that's important for me. How do the pedophiles see us? I think it's important to, to get behind their eyes and, and see, you know, they're not nervous. They're not, they're not like sneaking around, tiptoeing around. They're blatantly doing this stuff in front of you and in their minds they're thinking, I can't believe, I can't believe these people are actually this blind to it. And so it's, you know, I think magicians, when they're on stage, it doesn't feel like magic to them. You know, it's, it's actually probably pretty boring. I actually have a question for you. Um, it's, uh, um, so to, uh, Steve and I, it's uh, certainly uh, open up this uh, whole new way of thinking about uh, how abuse and misdirection connect with each other and that uh, what families and caretakers can, can be blind to. But uh, how do you distinguish, or I even wonder, is, is there a level, because uh, are there families who are actually complicit if, uh, if say, a family member is involved? Or, or, or would you say that uh, that's uh, extremely rare or maybe doesn't even happen, that there's always some... Um, twisting or a uh, different way of seeing it where there is no actual complicity uh, even in the most apparently blatant cases? I don't know that it's ever been measured, um, so I, I don't know the answer. Our law enforcement here probably knows the answer better than that. Uh, you know, how, to what extent do the families know about it and go along with it? Um, I imagine it's probably fairly rare, uh, but but I don't know. I know in our case, and you know, with consulting with, with dozens of churches and talking to hundreds of, of families of uh, perpetrators, um, they're absolutely devastated and floored. I mean, they, went, they experienced the same thing that we experienced where it's this pinching yourself in this disbelief. And you guys see it on, you know, anytime a, a, a media uh, microphone gets shoved into somebody's face, it's, we, we never in a million years would think this person is capable of this. They're not just saying that, um, they actually believe that. So I, I think it's probably rare um, where the family is complicit in, in, in that abuse, but, but it certainly happens. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, either someone's been conditioned to enable this to go on, or they life is easier if they enable the person to come. That's a good point too. Yeah, and and uh, you know I, I hear it a lot with um, with income and reputation are probably the two biggest things. Um, if I turn this person in, you know. <clears throat> It's going to wipe out the income, the family income, or it's going to hurt, oddly enough, the abuser's reputation. That's what people worry about more. And when you think about the dynamics of sexual abuse, you also have to consider the fact that parents themselves could have been the victims as well. So maybe a parent is seeing something, but it triggers a memory of their own victimization, and they dissociate it, and they don't even, they have to use their own coping skills to move past it. So, um, I'm yeah. the director of the Child Advocacy Center here in Somerset, and we see that a lot. It's actually, um, I don't even think sometimes that the parents realize that they see things happening. Um, but there is. I mean, you have to look at so many other factors, socioeconomic, um, is there domestic violence, are they fearful? Um, so there are a lot of situations where other family members are aware of it happening, but the consequences Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Randy? A question for you, especially following up on what, what Sarah just said. Do you have any suggestions or recommendations for those of us in the room who are in a position of questioning either victims or perpetrators on tactics? We've been keeping everything that you said in mind so far. <laughs> Do you have any suggestions on uh, tactics, tactics or approaches that we could benefit in, by, by using you know, 
question? I would say on, on, I mean, I don't know what you guys want to add to this, but I would say on, on the victim side of it, um, asking them more, more, more specific questions and, and really kind of entertaining this idea of, you know, did, did this, did any of this abuse happen in front of other adults? Um, well, and, and let me, let me jump in too because I don't want to, I, I didn't phrase that question well, and Sarah would be happy to want to say this. <laughs> We're not going to be questioning victims. Okay. That, that's, yeah. that's a shout at Okay. So I guess yeah. I'm talking more about the perpetrators. Yeah, so for the perpetrators, I, I really don't, I don't know because they're so good and skilled at lying. Uh, Larry Nasser, you know, to, to, to use him again, just because it's fresh and was very public. Um, he was uh, he was actually brought in and interviewed uh, by a police department back, I don't know, not that long ago, several years ago. Might have been 2014. Um, but he had been brought in for, for questioning because a victim had come forward. And um, he... He wasn't nervous. He he didn't stammer around. In fact, he brought in his laptop into the police department and showed them pelvic floor techniques on his laptop while he was being questioned uh, after a victim came forward. And he said, no, 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 she must have been mistaken because here's what a pelvic floor technique looks like and this is exactly what I did. And here's why, you know, you can see how she was mistaken and thought that this was this was sexual abuse. He walked out of that police station uh, a free man. You know, so I, they're so good at lying and so skilled. Um, I think even lie detector tests are, are not a solid measure. Um, they just, they don't get nervous, typically, unless you can trip them up. Um, but you have to be really skilled at manipulation and, and be able to get into their mind in order to do that. And it's, I mean, it's, I don't really know how to explain and put that into words, how to do that. Um, I've consulted with churches and, and um, have been able to write scripts for people where we've tripped pedophiles up and got them. Um, one guy actually walked himself into a police station. He had been abusing um, dozens, if not hundreds of boys for over 40 years. Um, we, were able, we were able to get him to literally walk himself into the police station. Um, so, I, I, don't, I don't know. Um, I think that's just such an unexplored area. Um, I think when we collaborate this evening, uh, it's certainly something to, to think about and talk about. You know, how do we develop the questioning techniques to know when and how people are, are deceptive? I, I don't know. There's something that seems um, very promising to me and that uh, I'm looking forward to discussing more about this is about uh, what families can do to recognize this to in, by way of prevention. Because uh, as you <clears throat> mentioned earlier, the classical red flags is uh, too little, too late. Yeah. So uh, instead of uh, waiting for these red flags to appear, what, what can you do to, to prevent? Yeah. I, I think step one, for, first off, the answer is we, don't have much. We don't know much about it, right? Scientifically, we don't. We have to like start to understand uh, if our hypotheses are right. For example, are they actually using essentially magician techniques to get away with these things? If they are, then that gives us something specific to address, right? That we can start to address. Okay, well, how do you thwart a magician, and therefore how do we thwart you know? So, so that would be a uh, handle, but we don't have that. So, so the answer, what you could use right now, I would say, first off, awareness that you, you all now know that we could show you anything and it could be something else, right? There shouldn't be much, much uh, difficulty believing that after the last couple hours, right? That what you see is not necessarily what you get. And, and so the idea that you, uh, that, that people may not have ever noticed that this was happening doesn't mean anything, right? So the awareness that you may not even realize that this is happening and that you need to be aware, therefore, that this could be happening to your child is step one, right? 
what are the situations where this could be happening, where there's nobody else around between your child and some, some adult that you don't trust or shouldn't trust or may not be able to trust even if you think you trust them, right? Would be one way. Maybe, uh, for example, Susanna and I, we don't allow our kids to go on slumber parties, ever, for any reason. They would never will. Until they're 18, then they can, but they will never be on a slumber party. We decided this many years ago, based on our own experiences. It's just never going to happen. That's why. Right? Because we don't know the parents in those houses. We have no idea if they're good or bad. I don't know. Well, that's one way to avoid it. So, I'm not saying that these are the same techniques you have to use, but being aware that this can happen without you realizing it, and those seem like such nice people, doesn't mean anything. Right? So that's step one, anyway, to answer your question. So, I don't know if that's helpful, but we'll move forward from there. I think, um, I'll, I'll get to you, Heather. Um, one, of, one, of, one of my goals, and I don't know how attainable this is, again, we're in uncharted territory. Um, one of my goals is for us to think through the eyes of, of, of the magician to get up on stage to shift the camera. Um, all the research right now in the in, in the area of pedophilia, it's look for the red flag behaviors, and it's literally like looking for a needle in a haystack. And your best of your best researchers in the field say, we're not confident walking in a room and being able to pick a pedophile out. Uh, Anna Salter, who uh, she is a she's also uh, from your alma mater. Uh, she's a Harvard graduate, uh, one of the leading experts in the world in the area of pedophilia, she says in this book, I cannot with any bit of confidence walk into a room and be able to spot a pedophile out of a crowd. Um, I come back and, and I just, maybe it's just the fighter in me, but I'm like, that's unacceptable. Like, there are ways. I think we just, it's, for me, uh, again, part of this is theory, but I think that we have the camera pointed in the wrong direction. We're looking through the wrong lens. And so, we're sitting in the audience, and we're trying to pick the magician out on the crowd. And so even when we know we're going to be fooled, we're still fooled. Um, whereas if we shift the camera and come up on stage with the magician and say, okay, teach me, teach me how you see these people. When you're up here doing these tricks, how do you see these people out in the audience? What, is it, what, what are your techniques? What are you specifically using? And how do you see them? Not how do we look for the pedophiles, but how do the pedophiles look for us? Um, I think once we have that perspective shift, it becomes much easier at, at spotting people who are at least, at a minimum, being deceptive. Um, so but I want to go many steps beyond that and, and say, you know, when there's a hand on the shoulder and they're playing with your spotlight of attention, um, I want us to be able to intervene and say, I know exactly what you're doing. And, you know, I just watched you use seven different techniques in the last seven seconds. So th this is very interesting. I think what you're saying, that, uh, and correct me if I'm misunderstanding, but what you're saying is that a, a promising um, way forward would be to identify children that are at risk because they're not being watched closely or the they're uh, having contact with uh, adults that are, uh, is not well supervised or and that, uh, and that the predators will flock to those children, basically. Yeah, and it's not just the children. There's, you know, we, have, we have this assumption in, in this field that they find vulnerable children and they make those their targets. That's only part of the equation, and that's a very small part of the equation. Um, it becomes a matching game. They have to match the proper vulnerable child to the proper vulnerable parent or caretaker, whoever it is, because it doesn't no good if they have a child who's vulnerable, which pretty much describes 99% of children. Um, children are just malleable. They're, they're concrete thinkers. You tell a kid to move this direction, unless you're the kid's parent, they're, you know, they'll follow orders. Um, so, you know, children are, that's the easy part. The hard part is finding a child whose parents are going to be blind to the abuse. How do you know that? They have to know beyond the shadow of a doubt that when they abuse that kid, A, the kid's not going to tell, and B, the parents aren't going to come on to them. The parents aren't going to figure it out. The magician, you know, they create a script where the audience can't go back and reconstruct. You talked about it, Susanna. They can't go back and reconstruct 
that act. They ensure that that can't happen. So how do they do that with the parents? They do it through this series of, again, this is, this is theory at this point, but they begin this series of benign testing with, with a parent. Um, a parent like me, um, I'm not arrogant enough to say that my kids will never be abused, but an abuser is going to know intuitively the second they walk into a room, here's an intuitive guy. This, guy. this guy has a heightened awareness. His eyes are constantly moving. He's watching me. He's monitoring people. He's watching people. Um, probably not safe to mess with his kids. Um, so that's interesting. So just building on what these folks said. I mean, one way to do that, one way to go forward would be to uh, not just identify um, you know, the people that, that are sex offenders, and, um, but to, to identify the conditions under which they are looking for to commit an offense, and then to minimize those conditions. So that, therefore, you'll minimize the, the amount of time. So they look for their audience. And so, it's not, and so not just the, the, the sex offenders themselves and the people that they might pre prey on, but the conditions under which they do that typically. And by reducing that, we'll reduce the, the access, in a sense. So that might be one, one of many possible ways that we need to, to, to reduce this. Uh, but it might be something that's very tractable. And it, it occurs to me that um, the one population of offenders that, uh, that would be a lot more problematic because of the setting up of the right conditions is people in the medical professions because uh, they're implicitly given and explicitly given a lot more permission to be in physical contact yes. than a random person uh, in other fields. Yeah. So uh, I, I'm wondering along those lines, is it known whether uh, with Larry Nash, for instance, there were um, families, there were children that he did not abuse because uh, they were inherently more suspicious or they were watching him more carefully? I think that's probably unknown, but, I, but my, my educated guess is, yeah, I think there were absolutely families. There were victims that are, you know, would be victims that never were victims because parents had a heightened awareness. Um, interestingly, one of the victims, at least one of the victims um, of, of Larry Nassar's, who was an actual victim, uh, both parents were in the medical profession field. So, you know, for, for me, in my mind, right away, my mind went to, for Larry Nassar, that was, that was a challenge accepted. That was like the, you know, the, um, that was the grand prize to be able to abuse the child whose, whose father and mother are both uh, medical doctors. Um, so, but there was something about those parents that let their guard down and it could be the fact that they're not abusers and they're in the medical field so they take that for granted that, you know, yeah, when, when my daughter goes into the room, uh, this person's acting in a, in a professional manner and so that his, you know, both his and her guard goes down and the abuser knows that. Larry Nasser knew that and he used that. He exploited that. Um, Heather? Um, but I can see in some of the ways that this is portrayed and just knowing how people can be that they can flip this, at least with older kids. Um, well, they could use that deception, can't they? They could have missed, miss saw something. Do you think there's an argument against that? Or can you see that somebody would make that argument? Does any of that make sense? Describe that a little bit more so I understand exactly like, what you're saying. Um, just in how we were talking about the deception that people have, um, that abusers use. Yeah. If somebody could flip that and say that a victim could do that, would you see that? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I think absolutely people would do that. It's um, kind of like, especially with the research. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like I'm just kind of playing the devil's advocate here. Yeah. Because I know that without this research, victims can be blamed. Um, and I yeah. know that some people just have it in their minds that kids are liars. So. Yeah. I think that's why it's important to really dig in and, and research very specific techniques because, because it's highly technical. You know, it's not... You're, you're not just given generic, that's what I, I really get irritated with, with the red flag behaviors because they're just so generic. And, and I, you know, I've used, I've used, you've taken this analogy of the magicians and I've said, okay, let's, let's reconstruct that and put, that, put it in a different context and say, I'm going to give you red flag behaviors for, this, for Apollo Robbins. Um, he's going to be talking nonstop. Uh, he's going to use cheesy humor. He's going to... Um, draw your attention to, to 
different things that have nothing to do with, you know, what you think it's about, like the date on the coin, things like that. He, he's going to be constantly touching all over you. Um, he's going to be reaching into pockets. Um, those are the red flag behaviors. I've literally told you nothing about Apollo Robin's technique. And so it, it's exactly what we do. We, we, we develop these broad red flag behaviors that aren't specific at all to, to their techniques that they're using. And yeah. so, so well, yeah, we're not going to see it. We're protecting the kid. It is very technical. You can't just, that's what I was trying to say earlier. You don't go from being a, a non-offender to a, a, a supervised offender yeah. in a second. It takes a long time of testing sure, and, absolutely. and gaining all these techniques. Kids aren't going to go from, um, from non-liars to super-evolved liars in, in a second. And on the other side of that, and this helps with, with this, we believe, right? The, 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 the false accusation rate is so insanely small. Um, that yeah, it's less than 5%. Yeah, we believe. Yeah. And when we believe, then um, it takes away a lot of the power of the perpetrator to manipulate. Yeah. Because we believe what has happened is real. Yeah, I think the, the more specific we can we can research and come up with the actual tangible techniques and say we know beyond the shadow of a doubt that these are, these are these specific techniques that they're using and principles that they're using, um, it's going to be pretty hard to come back and say, you know, well, this kid, this kid seems like they're dishonest and they're, because we're using that now. Well, this is a dishonest child and the child's been through, through the system. You know, we hear all that stuff. Um, the victim blaming and victim shaming. Um, again, we're using very generic, broad strokes to say, well, this person's not reputable, so... There must be some layer, uh, some layer. I'm not. I have no shame. <laughs> I I don't claim to have all the answers. Um, I think we really need to network with people and start really getting serious about prevention and saying, how do we train people who are out in the world, um, in the real world where abusers finesse their way into the lives of these children? How do we start training people to intervene before the abuse ever takes place? And and it's going to be a challenge. Um, it's probably not going to happen in my lifetime, um, but I think we need to start building that foundation now and all coming together and, and saying, you know, this is, that giving people the only option to report abuse after it's happened is absolutely unacceptable, it's unethical, it's immoral in every sense of the words. Shifts. Oh, well, you know what? Every time. 
time he comes over, she's always sitting in his lap. Mm -hmm. He's always right. got his hands on her. Why is he asking to bathe her? So I think just providing that um, education up front as a service provider is the best thing for you to do at this point because you're right. You guys see it, it's reportable to child line, the report is made, then they come to the advocacy center and the child doesn't make the disclosure. So then what does, you know, there are limits that law enforcement and child protection have because there are very specific crimes code or child protective services law statutes that <coughs> say this is what abuse is. Yeah. Um, so we can't just unfortunately go arrest every single person or, you know, indicate reports of abuse against them unless it reaches that specific criteria. But then when those kids come to us, so you make that report, while it may not reach the criteria for charges to be filed or child protection to get involved, we can educate the family. You know what? Victim Services has a program, a safe touch with my body and me program. Why don't we refer them to that? So even though you guys may feel as service providers that you're doing nothing, it's still linking those individuals with other, you know, um, providers with the community that can provide better education. I'd say to, I, I want to add to that and say, you know, don't be afraid to pick up the phone either. If, if there's something that, you know, and we need to train people to do this. You don't have to wait till you've met the threshold of reasonable suspicion to pick up the phone and call your local police department. Um, our police only know what they're told. I mean, that's just the way it works. And um, it may not be a reportable incident. It may not be a whole lot of information, but... It may have been the third or fourth phone call that they received about that person that starts to help them put put pieces to a picture together. Um, and, I, and I've seen this happen, um, not, I don't want to say often, but it's happened enough that I've seen people go to prison um, just because people picked up the phone and called me. And I got several phone calls from different people saying, you know, hey, you did a training, you did a training at our church, and this guy just pegged on I, I developed an assessment tool, and they say, you know, this got pegged on 15 of your 20 uh, different areas in this assessment tool. And, you know, then somebody else will call and say, hey, there's, there's this guy in our church, and, you know, and then it ends up being the same guy. Um, and people have gone to prison, you know, because of communication. So I think we need to train people. Don't wait until you've met that threshold of reasonable suspicion to pick up the phone. Just communicate with your police department. They actually appreciate it. And uh, at least here, at least the borough in Somerset. <laughs> I haven't been hung up on yet. Anyone here from CYS? Still here. I spoke to CYS this morning about the safety plans. And alarm. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen It seems like, I mean, if I'm just going to kind of collect all the information, that, that what we can do right now with what we know is enhance prevention and reduce the situation, right? We reduce the situation for this happens. And then with, with further research, I think we can expand on that. I think we can, there, there may actually even be, you know, 
actual measurement tools by which we can find out, you know, have an idea of someone's bite from physiological measures if they're if they're a predator or not. It might be possible. So so we'll work on that as well. But the point is that that right now, I mean, I think preventing and reducing is something that can happen through awareness. And so that's what that's that's what we can do now. We should do that. And speaking of awareness. What month is this, Sarah? It is Child Abuse Prevention Month. I'm just thinking, like, are there some resources? So us sitting there telling families, you know, this, there's no way that this could have happened. You know, he's my, you know, husband, she's my wife. Um, I, they're never alone. Um, and like you were saying, this is happening right in front of here. So, I mean, some of the logical features that you showed us today, is there any way that you can provide us information on how to access those. So as providers, we could, you know, we have situations where kids disclose, you know, rampant sexual abuse when people are right there. Like, could we say, you know, we have, you know, an example of something. I want you to watch this. Tell me what you see. And then maybe they'll have these epiphanies that, wow, maybe we're, I really am. We're going to yeah. share some we can share some materials with uh, JV and you should feel free to use them uh, as needed. You guys, don't, you guys don't know this yet, but one of the things I was going to talk to you about today is um, the possibility of us gathering up um, survivors who, who have experienced this phenomenon. And I think there are plenty of them. Un unpack that from the survivor's perspective and, and then take my perspective from what I know about the abuser and then you guys, your perspective, what you know about the science of deception, and come up with some kind of a, a shortened, uh, shortened training video that's, you know, it's it's free, it's available to the public, and it's something that's not so complex that people don't want to watch it. You know, I, I think I think we could put yeah. something together that that that's really helpful. That's that's really why we're here. So that's why we suggested that that we come and Jimmy set this up, as we thought, you know, when we started communicating with each other, we thought, well, we can come and, and present these materials and, and give some awareness to this community of, of how these, these brain uh, foibles really can, can affect things, and just that awareness alone could help, and that now we're going to meet with Jimmy further today and talk about specific uh, demonstrations that we can put together to, to enhance the And I love the idea of a training video. Uh, I think that that would be very valuable. Yeah, I think it would be really important. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's not a video. 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 Yeah, I would also want to thank the Salvation Army for bringing the water and the cookies to us. But thanks you thanks, both thank so you much. We just feel so pleased and honored to have had you here and just appreciate it. Jimmy, everything you've done. Thank sure. you. Yeah, thank you.